Welcome to Innovation Hub. I'm Kara Miller. There are lots of ways of measuring raw power. But if a pollster called everyone you know and asked them to name one or two of the most powerful people in the world, I bet, for the most part, the votes would cluster around just a few names. Now, there are 7 billion people on the planet. So if we could pretty much agree on the number of people that you could fit in your living room, that's saying something. Sandra Navidi calls these people super hubs. They sit at the center of our human networks. If you know a guy who like knows a guy who has a lot of pull somewhere, super hubs are that phenomenon on steroids. They're the people who you meet when you get to the epicenter of the most powerful networks on Earth. Some are famous, others aren't. They just control big pools of money made up of little pools of money like your savings account and your retirement account. Navidi has spent years hanging out with these folks. She's the author of Super Hubs, How the Financial Elite and Their Networks Rule Our World. And she says, having a few queen bees isn't strange. That's actually how nature works. The thing is, in the last few years, super powerful humans have increasingly drifted away from the rest of us. And the results are scaring even them. The more connected individual nodes, in this uh, instance hubs, become, the more they move towards the center, and they're the most centrally located and connected to almost everything. And I argue in my book that the super hubs are so immensely powerful that they have managed to disable corrective mechanisms, and that's why we are in the state that we're in right now. Hmm. Okay, so how many people would you say are super hubs in the world, like are powerful enough to be called super hubs? There is no hard and fast number or way to define it. But for instance, I've just come back from the IMF meetings of the world at the International Monetary Fund in Washington. And there are hmm. a couple of thousand people, you know, central bank governors, finance ministers, bank CEOs, CEOs of big funds. And if you put them all together, I would say roughly, yeah, probably a couple of thousand, but you could just as well, you know, expand that definition. Or you could just say, you know, if you take the most powerful, just the CEOs of a few institutions and the richest billionaires, then you could probably limit it to a few dozen. It just depends on the definition. Hmm. Okay. And like how elite or how powerful you have to be, where the cutoff is, is what you're saying. Correct. It's not, it's not an accurate science. It's more an art. Right. So give me, uh, th- give me the names of a couple of people who you would say are clearly, in your mind, super hubs. And then, and then tell me like, what they do and why they deserve to be called some of the most powerful people in the world. Well, an example would be, for instance, Janet Yellen, the head of the Federal Reserve, the Central right. Bank of the United States. She's immensely powerful. Every decision that she makes, along with her board, of course, it's not just her, but she has the greatest influence within the Federal Reserve, um, impacts all our lives, how much we pay for our mortgages, how much we get for our savings. Then there are big bank bosses like Jamie Dimon, for instance, and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. They're very powerful CEOs in the banking system. And The decisions that they make, for instance, who gets loans, which industries they put their weight behind, contributes to, you know, job, the job market, for instance, but also and especially the influence that they wield in Washington with the political elite through the revolving door and through lobbying and their personal context. They're immensely influential. And these people sort of, quote unquote, rule the world because they have a good understanding of how this complex system works because they have sort of a bird's eye view. You said before that maybe once upon a time there were corrective measures to keep these folks in check, these really, really powerful rich people, but that some of those mechanisms for sort of correcting their, checking their power, correcting their behavior, that those mechanisms had been disabled. How did they get disabled? They get disabled primarily through power loss and through their through the influence that they wield. An example would be, for instance, regulation. After the financial crisis, we saw an increased regulation. For instance, Dodd-Frank is um, a law for, that applies to the financial industry that was supposed to keep the financial industry in check. And now that we have a new administration with pretty much the same networks, though, tying into it, we already see a move of getting rid of some of the regulations that are part of it. For instance, the remuneration of of CEOs in the financial industry. And 
it always gets to this better known better known as huge pay packages, right? Exactly. And um, but this is sort of the the this tendency is kind of natural due to power laws. And power laws say because in every system the no those nodes who have the most connections attract a disproportional number of more connections. Because a great number of connections um, is more of a guarantee for survival. And if you, for instance, think about other people, and again, this applies to any type of system, the biology or chemistry or whatever. And in human systems, if you imagine a cocktail party and you come into a room and there's somebody famous who's very important and interesting and surrounded by tons of people, then you will always see more people trying to gravitate towards that person in the center of the room rather than to lonely people who are standing at the fringes. And one of the points that's clear from what you've written is that this phenomenon is bipartisan or like it's nonpartisan. Both Democrats and Republicans who are elite are major players here. They get sucked in. And then, as you say, uh, once you have a job like head of the Federal Reserve or head of a major bank or president of the United States, you are the person at the cocktail party who people want to be around because you've got a job where you can move the levers. Yes, of course, you can make things happen. You're in the center of the network and basically nothing goes by you. The only thing that you can try if you're in opposition is try to get that super hub out of his position and movement that we're seeing right now, but it's hard. You're listening to Innovation Hub. I'm Kara Miller, and I'm talking with Sandra Navidi, author of the book Super Hubs, How the Financial Elite and Their Networks Rule Our World. You know, uh, you do talk in Super Hubs about kind of a weird phenomenon in which these incredibly powerful people will invite critics of theirs, uh, people like Paul Krugman, who's a columnist for The New York Times, or Thomas Piketty, who's a French economist, and they'll invite them uh, to speak to them at these incredibly high prices, sometimes approaching $100,000 an hour. Um, And I just wonder, why are the elite so interested in hearing from people who think, yeah, let's redistribute money more, you know, uh, and that the super rich are not all that great for society. I think the elite is very well aware of the problem, and many of them would Mm. like to change things. I once asked George Soros, who works within the system and capitalizes to a great extent on it, and then he does a lot of good with his money. And I said, well, why don't you just try to work the system more? And he says, well, as long as the system exists the way that it does, I work within the system, but that doesn't mean that I won't try to change it. Many super ops that I interact with will say that those thought leaders do have a point and we need to change the system. But they're sort of, and that's one of the key questions I ask, do these super ops, are they prisoners of the system or do do they hold the system prisoner? Right. Okay. So to that issue of whether we're going to change our values, I want to play for you a little clip of... Um, Bernie Sanders when he was running for the Democratic nomination. This is 2015. And here he is talking about something he talked about, uh, frankly, all throughout his campaign. He is still talking about uh, it, even though the campaign is over, the very, very rich. Now, the truth is that America today is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But most people don't know that. Most people don't feel that. Most people don't see that because almost all of the wealth rests in the hands of a tiny few. The issue of wealth and income inequality, to my mind, is the great moral issue of our time. It is the great economic issue of our time, and it is the great political issue of our time. And our message to the billionaire class is, your greed has got to end, and we are going to end it for you. Sandra Navidi, um, you... Uh, have heard Bernie Sanders, of course, but you've heard people all over the world, politicians all over the world, talk about the very rich. Do you think something's about to change? Do you think that if you were a member of this, you know, like tiny, tiny financial elite, you'd be worried? 
I'd be worried, but not specifically just about them. You know, we've seen that they have bought property in New Zealand or Australia, farmland in Canada. So I think in the end, they'll be fine. That's probably not the world that they would want to live in or for their children. But I'm more worried generally, and I think so are they, um, about the stability of the overall system. Because if we see... As a matter of fact, the World Economic Forum has a yearly protest, a protest barometer, and never in the history have there been more protests worldwide. And also the mm. National Security Advisor, former Brzezinski, has said we'll see you know, a global awakening of the masses because never have they been better educated and never before have they realized to a greater extent their helplessness. And so I think we are seeing these oscillations all over the planet, in the Middle East, in Europe, in the U.S., and either we'll see gradual orderly change or we will see see more disorderly disruptions, which could be negative for all segments of society. When when the elite get together at places like Davos in Switzerland, which is like one of these annual things where people are kind of locked in the Alps together networking, do they talk about, you know, what if, I don't know that they think about it, what if the revolution's coming, but like, what if things are about to change in a major way? Does that seem to be a concern? I would say it's the number one topic because they are afraid uh, with regard to the political polarization that we're seeing everywhere as a result of the income gap and opportunity gap that we'll see polarization to either end, either the extreme left or the extreme right, but out of extremism, nothing good can come. We seen in history. And I think, you know, we need to wait and see what's going to happen in the U.S. But I think initially, there was also that, you know, this um, isolationism, nationalism, closing of borders, keeping out foreigners is kind of an extreme swing of the pendulum to the other side. So one of the things you also talk about, and you've been to Davos many times, as you say, you've met a lot of these people and, and, and talked to them. Um, one of the things you mentioned is there are, the super hubs all have, not all, but many of them have a lot in common. Uh, they are mostly white and mostly male. Can you explain why there are not that many women and not that many non-white people as part of the super hub group? Yes, it's because of the law of homophily, like and like attracts. And so they're in positions of power. And um, as an example, when they hire other people, and it's called the airport test, with whom do you feel more comfortable? With whom have, do you have the most in common? And we all sort of operate in that way. It's not necessarily conscious. It's not necessarily meant to be discriminatory. Uh, you know, they're not and it's the, air, it's the airport test because who would you want to hang out with in an airport, right, if your flight was you delayed? You get stuck, exactly, which is a right, very right. timely example. people like you is the answer. People like yourself. Right. You know, they have the same background, same schooling. They vacation in the same place that they have a lot to talk about. And if people have a lot in common, they tend to trust each other more. It facilitates communication. It's just makes things easier, especially in times of crisis, for instance. Also, it saves costs within institutions if people are the same and think the same. They don't have to ask many cumbersome questions. And that's part of the reason why there are, for instance, fewer women, less minority in general, even though it's gotten better at the entry level. That is more diverse, but up to a certain level. And then it gets you know, pretty much just male and white. Sandra Navidi is the author of Super Hubs, How the Financial Elite and Their Networks Rule Our World. She's also the founder and CEO of the consulting firm Beyond Global. Sandra, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Kara. It's been a pleasure. Ian Brimmer is an international analyst who gets up close with world leaders and people who run large banks and others in powerful positions. I asked him last year if it worried him that those folks had become so separate from the rest of us. It does worry me because I'm a part of it, and I wasn't raised that way. Um, I don't like it. I, I don't. I don't like. I mean, I, I love the luxuries of it. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, the fact is that it's it's very disconnected, and it's very easy if you're in that environment to not remember or care about the fact that you're not there to serve the interests of